All right, everybody, and it looks like it is about that time. Welcome. My name is Celine Figueroa, and uh, on behalf of the Denver, Muse Denver Museum of Nature and Science, I am so grateful to welcome you all today. We have such a fantastic program in store for you all. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science is pleased to partner with the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management and the Denver American Indian Commission to present Indigenous film. Uh, tonight's presentation is part two of a two-part uh, presentation. Today will be the discussion with the filmmaker Nicole Ma. If you have not gotten to already watch the film, it is fantastic. I highly recommend it. I just dropped our the link. It's available for streaming on our YouTube page um, until tomorrow. And then afterwards, you can always go and I'll drop the link to Bujapari's website um, to learn more and other ways that you can purchase the film or watch it. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome, um, I, excuse me, I'd like to welcome Jean. And Jean, I'm so sorry, the your bio just disappeared for me, but uh, she is the counsel for... Oh, let me help you out. Thank you. <laughs> General counsel for the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management. Uh, but the more relevant title, uh, I am film festival director for our Indigenous Film and Arts Festival. I think most of, most of the folks in the audience know we present uh, both an annual Indigenous Film and Arts Festival and a monthly Indigenous Film Series. When the festival went virtual last year, we decided we would present the festival as a two-part event. Last fall, we started with a series of film screenings and discussions and tonight, uh, we are kicking off our spring events. The film tonight, Putupati and the Rainmakers, fits beautifully with our festival theme of Places of Memory. Uh, it's the final film of the festival, and in the next couple of months, we will have our virtual art exhibit and artist talks and related panels. If you want to stay up to date on those events, you can check our website and our Facebook page, and I think Celine is uh, if she hasn't already put them up, she is about to put up those links. So tonight, uh, the program tonight is the coming together of the annual festival and the monthly film series. So lots of folks to thanks. Um, you, as you were logging in, you saw scrolling on the screen the logos of our sponsors and our community partners. I just want to mention our major festival sponsors, the National Endowment for the Arts the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and Arts and Society. And of course, our monthly uh, sponsors, Mile High, Behavior, Be <clears throat> excuse me, Mile High Behavioral Healthcare and Kuvo Jazz Radio. So thanks to uh, all our sponsors, we could not be presenting these programs without their support. Uh, so now if you wanna, if you wanna type in your, your applause, emojis into the chat room, feel free to do so. Um, but thank you to all our sponsors. Uh, tonight with us is Nicole Ma. She is the director of tonight's film. We have, we, we may also be joined by Putupati, who you saw in the film. He is in a community with very limited Wi-Fi. Uh, he is trying, he's going to try and connect with us to, to join the conversation. So if he's able to find a, a Wi-Fi hotspot where he is, uh, whenever he joins, we'll, you know, we'll bring him up. Uh, but Nicole, welcome. We're so happy to have you here with us tonight. Thank you. Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, I do want to thank you, Jean and Merv and the International Institute of um, Indigenous Resource and also the Denver Museum of Nature and Science for hosting this discussion. I'd also like to acknowledge the Walmajeri and Wongajonka people of the Great Sandy Desert for sharing their story with us and to their elders past, present and future. And I hope that, you know, that somehow with this film and the films that follow that we can learn from the indigenous people, especially in Australia because their connection is still so strong here. Um, Yes, I'd just like to welcome everybody and say hello. Thank and you. thank you for having me. 
Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. So I think to start off the tonight's discussion, you had a production company in New York. You made right. some, some music videos. You, uh, you did a lot of work here in the, in the US. Can you tell us how you ended up in Australia and how you came to the community of Fitzroy Crossing and uh, kind of the background to making the film, because that's not initially why you went. No, no. Um, I, I'm actually Australian born Chinese and uh, I went to New York to, um, well, I just went to New York as one does. <laughs> and, and, and it was in New York that I had my apprenticeship at, in film doing music videos and music films and um, and I eventually wanted to come back to Australia and uh, a friend of mine in New York was um, doing the National Museum of Australia which is a new Australian camp in, in Canberra in 2000 and she asked me if I would produce the multimedia so that brought me back to Australia and also into the indigenous Aboriginal arena because half the museum was Aboriginal and the director was indigenous. And I didn't know anything, absolutely anything about the Aboriginal people in Australia. And so I had to learn really fast in order to talk to my American colleagues about the history of Aboriginal Australia. And that was a, a huge learning curve for me. I had to travel to all the remote communities and see who would want to be involved in the museum. And I eventually landed in Fitzroy Crossing where Puttaburi lives. And um, initially I met his, uh, his grandparents, Spider and Dolly, who are also featured in the film. And I was pitching, you know, the various films and things that I was thinking about wanting to make for the museum and also other films that I was working on. And they, they weren't very interested. They were very focused on their own community and their own country. And um, it happened to be that the, uh, the woman who was running the art center was an old friend of mine. So I was able to come in sideways, so to speak, into the community, because usually it takes many, many years to get to know anybody in the community. But because um, Karen had been there already for 20 years, she had laid this foundation to, of trust with the older people. And she was telling them that I was a filmmaker and what film was about and how it could be used to educate. And Dolly actually was very forward thinking and, and she immediately latched onto the idea of filming this, uh, this journey that they were about to take to Goral, which is their sacred waterhole in the desert. And they hadn't been back there for 40 years. And she said, well, we don't want to do any of that other stuff that you're talking about, but um, you can come and film us at Koral. So I thought, well, okay, <laughs> that sounds all right. So I went, I actually got a commission from our ABC, which is our national broadcaster to make a little film about going there. And that was the beginning of my relationship with um, the community. And in particular, Dolly and Spider, who were like the custodians of Goral and really understood the unique properties that film have in what they were trying to do, which is to perpetuate the culture, the songs and dances and the country. And they could see that having film really um, enabled that, that they were, it was a way for them to be able to pass on this knowledge to future generations. So that's initially how I came to be into in the community. I became their go-to filmmaker. Anytime they wanted anything filmed, they'd bring me up and I'd have to go there. And so I would. So I spent over 10 years filming them. Well, kudos to you for saying, I'm willing to scrap what I came here to do and do what you want me to do. Because I, I think that the, the collaborations that, that we're drawn to come about from exactly that circumstance where it's, um, it's driven by the community um, yeah. and it's 
the, you know, the filmmaker is representing what the community wants presented to the world. That's right. It, it's sort of an agenda that, um, you know, it feels to me like both sides have to, to have uh, their needs taken care of. Like I did want to make a film. I did want to learn about Aboriginal culture and they wanted a film to be made and they wanted to teach. So we sort of fit together in, in our needs. And I think it's important if as a filmmaker that when you go into a community like that, that you do recognize that there's mutual, um, a, a mutual collaboration going on so that you can tell the story in the way that they want it to be told rather than the way you want it to be told. I mean, that took me many years to learn because I struggled with this story for a long time about how to tell it. And a lot of times my expectations weren't being met in the community because they just weren't interested <laughs> in what I thought was interesting. So I, I spent a lot of time trying to learn their worldview. To, to what extent did you have uh, people in the community looking at uh, what you had filmed as, as you're going through the, the editing and, and post-production process? Did you get input from the community? Oh, all the time. I sent them everything, anything I filmed. And I spent 10 years filming and I made lots of, we worked together on a lot of exhibitions and things because they're also famous artists and that big canvas, I, I traveled to that big canvas for a long time as well. Um, I, whenever I shot anything, I would just transfer it into a format that they could watch and I would just send it to them. And they just spent hours, you know, that was their go-to thing to watch at the art center. It was constantly playing anything that I had filmed they watched. They weren't very keen on editing. They always said to me, why do you do that? You know, you didn't put in, you know, at one stage I'd taken a crane into the desert because I wanted crane shots and they loved the crane and they thought, well, we, you know, that's such a great thing. And why did you cut it out? You know, why isn't it in the film? <laughs> so, you know, we sort of had different ideas of, I had to explain to them that nobody wants to watch, you know, a hundred hours of country going by. <laughs> they couldn't understand why people didn't find that interesting. So it, it took a while for them to understand that an edited film wasn't really for them. It was more for teaching outside people what the story was about. Have they, has the community watched the, the final product? Oh, they have. We've had some great screenings in Fitzroy Crossing Outdoors. They they laugh and cry all you know all the way through it. It's very fulfilling to see the film with them. Very different from other audiences. <laughs> so I I mentioned uh, one of the the sponsors that I mentioned is Arts and Society, and the, their um, the philosophy of a lot of their work is art for social change. And one of the things that I really love about the film is seeing that huge piece of artwork that the community made that becomes you know, one of the drivers for, for getting the, the land title back. Um, and I wanna, well, I wanna introduce Murphs, which I forgot to do at the beginning of the program. <laughs> <laughs> Since I make the assumption everybody knows who he is. Uh, Murph Tano is the uh, president of our institute, and he is also uh, a commissioner on the Denver American Indian Commission, which is one of the uh, co-presenters of our monthly Indigenous film series. Um, and he, he wanted to um, raise some issues around the artwork that is, what I'm calling artwork, that is actually a map of mm. the area. So Mira, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, sure. All right. Just, I love the film. Thank you. I I, I love the film uh, on so many levels. Uh, uh, we started off uh, with a film festival. And, and then I think it was the, after the first year, I said, you know, we should, I suggested that uh, 
you might expand it to film and art because I, I i i saw the uh, the connection there but one of the reasons why we wanted a film to do film uh, was to uh, get these stories out there uh, mm -hmm. because film is a is really a powerful uh, medium uh, for presenting uh, ideas uh, in a uh, in sometimes a, a, a much more nuanced way uh, than a uh, uh, a law review article or a journal article uh, could do, and but it takes a in my view a, a very skillful sensitive uh filmmaker to uh to accomplish that uh because we've seen uh films uh, that were uh, not nuanced we've seen films uh that were obviously uh they 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 it was about a community, but it wasn't a, the, the community story. And this one, uh, uh, this film of, of yours and, and of, the, of the community is, uh, uh, it, it hits all the, the right chords in, the, uh, in, in my heart. So I really do appreciate uh, uh, you, your work. Now, one of the things that uh, I, I love about the film uh, is because uh, for me, it illustrates several of the issues that we deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the, uh, what you could say is the uh, map making, mm -hmm. or in this case, a, uh, a, a huge canvas, uh, which is actually a, a community-based uh, uh, map making, mm -hmm. but map, ma map making photography is always much more than about landforms. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, how people view the world, how people view their relationship to specific parts of the world, why their country, their land is important to them. It, it, it illustrates then the kind of a relationship uh, that they have with with the land, uh, with the things that grow on the land, that hover over the land, uh, uh, and all of the the two-legged and uh, you know multi-legged uh, uh, creatures uh, that inhabit the land with them. Well, in the case of the snakes. No legs. <laughs> uh, so, what I found fascinating was this joint effort to create this huge, huge canvas or map. Uh, the question I, I ask myself is that, all right, how did they get to the point where they could do that cooperatively? Who's making the kinds of decisions? as to whose stories were going to be told you know, and, 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 and how those stories were going to be told on the canvas. Okay. Um, well, that's the Nungara canvas. It's 10 meters by eight meters uh, big. And it was the um, Tommy May, who is in the film, it was his idea because at that time in Australia, native title was starting to gain traction, which is, you know, um, having Aboriginal, we have about 300 different indigenous language groups in Australia and each, you know, different ones were trying to get um, their land back in different forms. Native title in Australia just gives them 
the, the acknowledgement that this was initially their land. Sometimes they have rights to it, sometimes they don't, depending on what has happened to that land since, you know, since the, the, the white man came here. So when Tommy heard about all the anthropologists and lawyers were starting to work on their native title, which is the Wonka Jonka country in the Great Sandy Desert, he said, we don't speak their language. We don't understand what they're saying in the court. We don't know how to talk to them. But it seems to me that they really like our painting. He was a painter. Oh. And he said, well, I think what we should do is we'll just paint it, our country, and then they'll understand why it's our country. So actually, that's how it came about. He, he decided that, yes, this is what they were going to do. And this is what they were going to present to the court. And so um, Karen, who's my friend, which is why she's so uh, embedded in Fitzroy Crossing, she facilitated getting the canvas out into the desert because they didn't want to paint it anywhere but on country. So they, she had to get this huge canvas out or to the edge of the desert. It was impossible to get it to the actual, you know, Great Sandy Desert, but they, she got it pretty close. And 60 of the elders or 60 language groups around Goral, Goral was one of them, which is the one I've been to, they each sat on what they thought was a re in relation to that waterhole where, where their country was and they painted it. Now they're very, um, if you've ever watched Aboriginal people paint collaboratively, they never discuss what color or where's your country or anything like that, or what am I going to paint? They just sit in what they think is their area that represents their country and they just paint. And I don't know how it happens, but it all seems to fit together. And also it also happens to look absolutely awesomely beautiful for some reason it's just gorgeous but they never consult they just do it and what they're doing is in aboriginal culture they're only allowed to paint their country not anybody else's so no one can say to you that's not right that story doesn't go there or this is wrong the only problem they had with the canvas was the canning stock route which is the white man stock route that was made and that cut across all those countries. So if you look at the map carefully or the canvas, you'll see a white line and then all the countries are arranged around where in relation to that line. But they had to do that canvas twice because the first time they weren't happy with how it, where that line was because it was very difficult for them. They have a very amazing spatial aerial um, knowledge of their country, but with the canning stock route cutting through it, it threw them off a little bit. So the first one they did, which was what they call the small canvas, didn't work because they didn't feel the relationship was correct. So that's when they decided to do the big canvas, the Nora canvas. And that's the one that's in the film. So it, it, it to them, it's not, what we consider a map, it's actually an embodiment of their country. You know, they can't always go out there. It's very difficult. It's, you know, it's so remote. It takes even for us to, got, to get to Goral, it took about a week and um, very hard travel. There's no roads. So to them, when they stand on the canvas, and I've seen this many times, it embodies their country. They'll cry, they'll sing to it, they'll call to their spirits. They do everything that they would do on country on that canvas. It's very sacred. Yeah, thank you. Can you can you speak to the the kind of reception that the canvas got? I mean, we, we saw it in the in the art gallery as a piece of art, people seem to love it. But in terms of using it as as a Legal a legal document to assert the land claim, what kind of response did they get? It was very poor, the response. They, 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 after they completed it, um, Karen and the different lawyers and anthropologists took the canvas and the elders who painted it, at least, you know, over 60 of them, to Canberra, which is our capital city, 
and laid it out on the um, on the uh, parliament's lawn and nobody came. No politician came to look at it. No one came to talk to them, nothing. It was barely it made the news. So we have a very poor record of actually um, taking, so, you know, actually being able to understand that it's a different worldview to ours and that the, our, our legal system and the Aboriginal system is very different. And I, I, I really enjoyed reading, uh, Merv, what you'd put in at the top of the, in the chat about, what did you call it? Um, uh, cultural imperialism. Yes. I absolutely think that that is um, what we're fighting against. I mean, even me as a Chinese person, I feel it, but I know that the Aboriginal people, you know, they don't name it that way, but I see it as being that, you know, that th there's no way that the politicians in Canberra can acknowledge that there is another worldview other than their own. Exactly. And, and that's, that's one of, for me, one of the most kind of uh, uh, insidious uh, characteristics of uh, this kind of uh, uh, imperialism, because it's you can you can talk to folks and uh, they, they will speak to you, and you have a sense that they don't have any malice but they are who they are and we are who we are the problem is that the the, the system is their system mm. the, the 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 language is their system the way they see the land how they characterize the land how they characterize the, the, the things that are on the land are uh, completely different. Right? So when you see uh, the water hole, they mean uh, uh, so much more than just watering cattle. Yes, but for someone who uh, has now taken over their country, that's that's how they view the uh, the land and uh, and the water. Mm. So can can you say a, a bit more about how the uh, uh, the people uh, kind of uh, view the uh, the water? Um, they view everything um, as living. Everything is living. To them, the water is a living being. So that the, the water in that water hole is what they call, uh, it's translated as permanent water. Ajilla is the, is the, is the Wonka Jonka name. And Jill is translated as living water. And it means that that water is always there to, um, to help them. It'll always, they can depend on it. So that water, you know, when you see the digging out ceremony is them going in and cleaning, what they call cleaning the water hole so that the snake spirit is happy you know, he becomes happy when he's being taken care of because they see it as a reciprocal relationship. If they clean the water hole and they make the snake spirit happy, he will in turn send rain to the land, which in turn will bring the, the, um, the, the animals and, and the, um, the plants that they need to eat. So they, the, it's, it's, 
it's a reciprocal relationship. I mean, I think in our in our society we understand it in a sort of superficial way, in that you know we if we plant uh, a vegetable and we water it and take care of it, then we'll we'll then be able to eat it. But if we don't take care of the actual earth where it's grown, and we we it, we won't be able to grow vegetables. So it's in my experience with with this community is this they really understand this reciprocal relationship that they have with the earth that they're not the prom dominant being on this earth that they need other things in order to exist and one of those things is living water it's the animals it's the plants is it's the rain and that's why um you know, their, their ceremonies are all around rainmaking because they, they're desert people. I mean, in Australia, we have desert people, we have mountain people, river people, you know, saltwater people. So, you know, and each one has their different belief systems. But the main belief system is that the, the, the relationship we have with the earth and everything on it is reciprocal and collaborative. And so, is, is that answering your question? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, very quickly, uh, I, I'm, I'm doing a paper uh, for the Hawaii Conservation Conference, which addresses exactly that, that kind of reciprocal relationship and the idea that, uh, uh, that in, in this case, the plants, the seeds, are us, they're our family. Yes. Uh, and the idea of, of uh, sending our family to some cold storage in Norway uh, to preserve them for uh, uh, future generations might be a good idea uh, if you're a big time uh, uh, agriculturist. But uh, for us who have, uh, at least from my perspective, you want to see that seed do all the things that you need to do to help that seed realize its potential. Uh, putting it away in cold storage doesn't do that. It's, yeah. a, it's a very kind of a, a, a one-sided view of, of uh, uh, if you will, kind of a, the utility of that seed as opposed to the kind of relationship, uh, a more familial relationship uh, mm. with the seed and, and, and therefore the plant. Yeah. I see here that there's a question about fire and it, it's, yes. really, you know, the role of fire and, and fire is the same idea of, of cleaning out, you know, cleaning out the jilla, the water hole fire cleans the land so that it can regrow, regenerate. So whenever we go out there, you know, Sp Spider and, and some of the elder men will start setting fire to the countryside as we go along so that it burns back as we're going forward. And there's two reasons for that, for to regenerate the, the land so that it can, a lot of Australian plants uh, only can uh, only regenerate after fire. You know they're dormant till fire comes, and and the other reason is the smoke lets the snake spirit know in advance who's coming to visit him, and so it has a, a you know there's there's a twofold reason for creating you know for firing the land as we as we're traveling around it. Somebody was asking about um, the, a relationship uh, to death and, you know, re returning to the their homeland when, when they pass. Um, Dolly talks about that in the movie. And I, if you, when you, when you answer that, can you also um, bring everybody up, up to date on, on what, ha what happened with respect to their ownership of the land after the film? 
Okay. In the film, uh, it it leaves when they when they get that land uh, agreement, it has left Kurtal outside of the agreement. Okay, I'll start with death first. Um, they there there's a. Uh, I would I would call it um, you know different dimensions like death is a different dimension uh, to them they're not there's no fear about it because in my experience as someone who's actually like a, a an immigrant and doesn't have a home the thing that I was struck most about Dolly and Spider and Tom and and actually you know most of the the different indigenous language groups that I met in Fitzroy Crossing was that their connection to country was so um, was so embedded in their soul that they could travel there. They could astral travel there. They could dream there. They could they could go there in their soul anytime, even though they were living in Fitzroy Crossing, and they knew. That this, that this relationship to their country, they knew that all their elders are there. When they've died, all the ancestors actually live in this, besides the, the Goral snake spirit, all the ancestors are also living in, this, in the water hole of that particular group. And so when, when Dolly's talking about it, she's, she's um, saying, well, you know, when we die, of course, you know, we're going to go back there and join all our ancestors and then all our all our future generations, they're all going to come there as well. So we'll always be home. We'll always have this place where uh, all the generations will be will will be gathered. But because of and I think when the one of the times we went there, this had never happened before, the the water hole was covered with like a kilometer of water. It had a cyclone had gone through. In their memory, which is a long memory and it goes back, you know, 40,000 years, they'd never seen that happen there. So she thought she was worried that something had changed in their, uh, in either the way that the spirits thought about things or some, they've done, or something had gone wrong. And in fact, you know, when I was talking to the anthropologists and the scientists who were with us, you know, they put it down to climate change, that it was changing the land and that, you know, that in future it, it was going to get more wet rather than being very dry. But to Dolly, her ancestors were drowning. You know, the snake spirit was drowning, that he was dead. And she said to me, I'm a pensioner and I'm going to die and I'll have nowhere to go because, you know, the land is no longer the way it used to be. So she was very worried about what was going to happen when she died because, you know, Goral, and they really um, relate to Goral as, as, one, as themselves as well because she said, I'm a pensioner. Well, he's a pensioner now too, you know, the snake spirit. So maybe he died and then nothing, you know, there was nowhere for him to go because they, the water was covering his water hole. So there's a lot of implications in things like climate change and mining that change the, the country in a way that is not good to continue that reciprocal relationship and to continue the idea that this is their home and their homeland. And their soul, you know, their soul actually resides there, all their ancestors' souls. So can you can you update folks on the status of, of that portion of the land claim? Well, um, Gora was left out because, you know, because of the way that the boundaries were made in the in the white man way. But we went back to court and in fact the um, the the judge looked at the, the film, Budabari, and he said, well, of course it's their country. <laughs> and they've got it back. Wow. They that's used it, they used it as evidence. I'm sorry. 
I was going to say it's better than any award you ever could have won. It was. It, I <laughs> cried, actually, because, you know, he said, this is evidence. <laughs> but all I'd done really was I'd put together all the evidence that I'd found along the way and, and made it one sort of uh, document. Oh, and I, is wanting to know about um, cattle grazing. Is it still, does that still occur on their lands in, in yeah. the whole area? Yeah, big cattle grazers. Yeah, a lot of cattle and camels. Camels are not indigenous. I see that there's a, um, a question there about it. The Afghani Pakistani um, cameleers were brought to Australia during the gold rush because camels were able to, you know, transport material in the desert. But since then, there's been no use for them. So they've gone wild and they've actually become quite a pest. That's another pest besides climate change that's happening in the deserts in Australia. There's herds of wild camels that are destroying the water holes and the sacred, you know, all the sacred water holes. Yeah. And, and um, cats too, which are not indigenous. Someone asked um, about language groups as opposed to um, what in the US we, when we re refer to American Indian tribes, it was noticing that the, there's a reference to language groups um, and wanting some, uh, just some clarification about that. Yeah, there, there's like two or three, there's three, nearly 300 um, Aboriginal language groups and they identify by language groups. Um, there's also clan names like in, in Melbourne, there's an, there's overall clan, well, probably, you know, you would call clan or tribe names. Like in, in Melbourne, the overall clan name is the Kulin Nation. And so each, you know, different areas have uh, an overall name, but I'm no expert on why, how, what, what the breakdown is. I haven't um, really studied, you know, the, the urban uh, Aboriginal ways of naming things. I only, my, my great experience is very narrow. It's only in that little uh, in the Great Sandy Desert and with the Wonka Jonka Walmajeri people. And all, when I, in Fitzroy Crossing, they call themselves by their language groups. There's Bunaba, there's Nunga, you know, there's all these different types of language groups that belong to different parts of the country. Fitzroy Crossing is, is um, Bunaba and, you know, Broome, which is on the West Coast, which where you have to fly into. Western Australia to get to Fitzroy Crossing, you know, they're Noongar people. So um, I'm not really that au fait with the urban way of naming different clans and nations. It's, it seems to be each area and it seems to me it's sort of, you know, the way we have divided up Australia into states that they've made those nations part of um, the states. But I haven't studied it, so I, I don't want to mislead you in any way. Uh, we also we have a question um, about uh, whether the, the new the boundaries or the, the land that was returned uh, to the communities, whether that has been documented on official government maps. What this what this audience member is calling you know white white man maps no i doubt it you know it's such a huge if you look at the map of australia the great sandy desert and the little the great sandy desert the little sandy desert all those deserts they they, they take up the whole of the middle of the middle of australia we all live on the on the coasts and um in in white man's maps little things are starting to come up, but uh, there's, there's not much on it at all. They haven't mapped it out in their way. They, they can only, because they can't identify, 
you know, for instance, on the Nungro map, you know, we can identify Gorao because we, we've been there, we know it's there, Spider knows it's there, his community knows it's there. Same with all the other water holes on that map. But um, the, 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 I hate to call them white men, but I can't think of them. the Garias, we call them Garias in Aboriginal, in the Wonka Jonka. They don't, they don't acknowledge those uh, water holes as being significant places. So they're not mapped. Mm -hmm. The thing that is mapped, and which is why they put it on the Nungaroo canvas, is the great is the um, Canning Stock Route. That's the only white man. Um, uh, what what do you call it? You know, a white man symbol that they have that they understand that they've put there. Sometimes they might put in. Um, you know, they might have built a, 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 not a dam, but you know, a, um, a water catchment or something. I mean, when they built the Canning Stock Route, they were looking for water to bring cattle so that they could herd cattle to the gold fields south to north. So they built the, the Canning Stock Route. And in order to do that, they had to have water. So they forced the Aboriginals to show them where their water holes were so that they could dig wells and from the wells use that water to water their, the cattle. That destroyed quite a few sacred water holes, you know, because the Aboriginals feel that, that those water holes, the spirits were killed by, you know, digging out by, by making those constructions over the water hole because the, the, the way that they build wells is not, it, it encloses the spirit. It doesn't allow it to be free. Yes, we've done some terrible things really. And so with the, um, with the return of the land and, you know, we saw the, um, first the, the young boys learning to dance, but then um, Hutupati's generation realizing that they needed to learn as well. Mm. Um, can you can you speak to the um, what to the extent that uh, traditions and customs are being revived and uh, is there more more frequent travel to the waterhole and, and more ceremony there? There is a more frequent travel to the waterhole. It, it just happens every 10 years or something because it's it does cost a lot of money to go out there. You know, when we, you know, it could cost a hundred thousand just to get the cars and the um, the fuel, because there's nothing there. Everything has to be carried, you know, carried, even though we hunt along the way and get food from the land, we have to be, because we take scientists and anthropologists, they have their equipment. If I went, I would have to have my equipment. You know, as you saw in the film, now they're starting to transport the um, elders because they've discovered helicopters. They don't want to go on a, a week long drive into the desert. They want to just, Tommy's like, I just go on the helicopter, you know, just, you know, it takes 10, 20 minutes. <laughs> so that's expensive too, to get helicopters there. And um, it's just impossible to go there. There's not a direct route. And you never know what you're going to encounter as well as how the country has changed and everything. So it's, it's not that much is done on country, but I have to say that because of Tom, Tom is, works for the Kimberley Aboriginal Law and Culture Centre, CALAC, and he's their cultural officer. And since he was 20, he's been um, supervising, you know, every two or three years, they have a, a, a corroboree, you know, a, a dance festival where all the different, the 36 language groups in the Kimberley come together and they share stories and what's going on and how things are going for each of them. And he's always, he supervised the singing and dancing for, for many, many years now. So he's like an encyclopedic uh, 
store of all of the 36 language groups, songs and dances. He can show you any, you know, if they don't know what to do, he'll get up there and, you know, show them what, what, the, what the moves and songs are. So he, he's also there, um, the law and culture person who helps with men's business, which I've never been privy to because obviously I'm not a man, but every uh, wet season, which is for us wet December and January, he takes the boys out and they do men's business, which is initiations and into manhood. And he's been doing that for since he's been 20 and he's nearly, he's nearly, he's 50 now. So he's, he's told me that, especially since this film has um, come out, which has now been about five years, more and more young boys have started to come to be initiated and to want to learn the songs and dances. So actually they're, they're feeling very positive about um, the ability to carry on these songs and dances, you know, if you go to some of these, these um, festivals now, they're, they're very vibrant and there's so many young people wanting to learn. And it's, it's just very encouraging for the culture to see that it's actually alive and well at the moment, you know, things are happening. And because of COVID, they were very, they did, they immediately, they locked it down. They locked down all the remote communities no one came in and out. And so they were spared a lot of the um, disaster that happened in the cities, in a, in a, in, even though we've been pretty lucky, but um, they didn't feel, uh, they didn't have any COVID at all because the, the, the powers that be locked, locked down all the communities and people weren't allowed to go in and out. But I think it's very positive uh, in, in in particular for the Kimberley and the Pilbara, because that is where the, the culture is, has this uh, relationship to the country that hasn't been that as disturbed as say on the East Coast where the, all the cities are, you know, and it's harder for the uh, more urban Aboriginals to gain traction to their culture. You know, they're more angry and sad that they've lost a lot of their connections Whereas the Kimberley and the and the Pilbara are so remote that they are they have the they have been able to um, keep the culture strong without interference, and it, it has been interfered. Of course, there's drugs and alcohol, the you know the issues that that confront all Indigenous people, but they because of the 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 distance, they have been able to keep a lot of the culture. And and um, and the old people have been able to pass it on, and and it seems to me as if it's it's quite positive for the young people there. And and they have to learn to to straddle, you know, our world and their world. It, that's a very hard thing to do. Is is there a, a woman that's playing the? the the counterpart to what Tom is doing with uh, with women's things and teaching the young girls. There are. Um, I don't know much about that either, because for some reason, you know, in life you just get sort of taken wherever you get taken. Goral is a man's business place, so even though I was with the women all the time, because I wasn't allowed to be with the men, I had to get a, a, a male cinematographer to film. Um, it, the women are very strong there. They're, in fact, they're stronger than the men, but um, there isn't one like Tom who, who's looking after, you know, all the songs and dances because the women, I don't know, the women are more um, collaborative and have their own way of passing things around. You know, they don't they 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 don't seem to have a, a specific leader like like Tom is. Or and in Calac, and Calac is pretty good, you know, on, on their board they always have for each language group, there's always a man and a woman representing the group. They never have one gender. They always have two. 
but in that in the case of Tom, it's a good question. I have never really thought about that too much about you know who's the counterpoint counterpoint to Tom in 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 the gender stakes. I'll have to ask him. Uh, are any of the, the, the lands that were uh, uh, part of this uh, effort, uh, are they under any kind of threat for uh, uh, mining and uh, other kind of development? They are. I mean, there's a lot of iron out there because, the, you know, as you can see, it's a red desert. Yeah. It's all iron. And, and a lot of, you know, uranium and a lot of other things there. It is a bit remote. You know, it would take a lot of money to develop. So I, I think what they, and, and corporations don't like spending a lot of money, you know, to, to on, on land that, that may not seem feasible, you know, to be financially feasible to, to work. I mean, maybe one day if it becomes very, necessary they will do it but i don't think at the moment that particular area which is coral and the great sandy desert is in danger too much on the outskirts of it though there is the danger of fracking fracking seems to be moving in a lot faster than one would like to see because it's seen it's um i don't know in australia at the moment they're, they're really big on gas as the next energy after coal, I don't know why. So fracking has become a problem. Yeah, that's going to have some uh, significant impacts on water. So we've got about four minutes left of tonight's program. Now is a great time, Nicole, if there's any other questions that you see in the chat that you really want to get to or any just final thoughts for our audience. I, I have a question. Uh, are the artists uh, there in uh, Fitzroy Crossing, are, are they part of a cooperative? And if they are, do they have a website? They do. I'll just type it here. Excellent. I found it interesting that Spider kind of uh, 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 focuses on the on the waterhole, eh? Pardon? Uh, spider, his art. Was it was it the spider art? Right. The, the the water hole. Well, that's all he paints. Yeah, right, right, right. right. I mean, both Spider and Dolly. The only thing they think about is Goral and how to how they can pass that knowledge on to younger people. That's all they thought about. That was constantly on their mind. Whenever they talked to me, it was all about how I could help them promote, um, you know, caretaking of Goral. And she's always was saying to me, you know. Keep working, keep working, you know, tell people about this story. Well, you've done a fantastic job so far. And um, I have that, I already found it. Oh, you already got it? Oh. Um, yeah, that's the one. I just want to um, encourage folks in the audience to go to the putupati.com website because Nicole has a lot of, um, there's a lot of small film clips you can watch. You can, you can, of course, if you want to have your own home use copy of the film, you can, uh, you can purchase it as a download, or uh, if you want to share with friends, they can stream it. Uh, but she also posts updates and uh, just lot, lots of good information for follow up. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much yes. for taking the time to do this. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. And, you know, sort of my job. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful job to have, Nicole. This, this, is a, this is a job that never ends, right? There's no such thing as post oh, never ends. 
even though you know Dolly and Spider have passed on, I always hear their voices in my head, and I've got their paintings, and they're always talking to me. <laughs> we were, our eye kept going to uh, the scenes where uh, Tom is in the offices, and there's canvases just lined up, leaning against the wall, and this little ad hoc art gallery. And if we can support a community by purchasing a piece of art then it's a win for everybody. Yeah. And really, you know, if you do purchase that, that, that sort of art is very, as you know, is so different from just an artist painting or painting, you know, it's, it's really about them, you know, it's about their soul. That's all they paint over and over and over again. And that's, that's the gift that they're giving you. I think, you know, that it's not, it's not any old painting. It's, it's, it has this long history and it has this connection to country and, and, and to a people and to a culture that's very special. Well, that is beautiful, Nicole. Thank you so much for joining us. Jean, Merv, as always, thank you so much for facilitating that discussion. I'm gonna go ahead and play our PowerPoint out. Uh, thank you to all of our audience members for such wonderful questions. We will see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.